Good evening, everyone. It is Wednesday, May the 27th, 2020. It is currently 6.51 p.m. Central Time, and this is our Wednesday evening service. I hope, I hope, and I pray that this is the last Wednesday evening service that has to be done this way, where there is no one in the building, and I'm speaking to an empty building. Um, This coming Sunday, we're back, uh, you know, meeting as as it was designed to happen. People will show up here and walk through the door and sit in these pews that are currently in front of me. And uh, I hope uh, that that's the last time we have to close everything down. I have no idea what's going to happen. I'm not here to get into all of the controversy and conspiracy theories about COVID-19. Uh, we did uh, go over the 100,000 mark for 100,000 deaths here in the United States of America. Things are opening up. Large crowds are forming in different places. Are we going to see a, a basically a, a second wave that comes in maybe during the fall? Um, you know, Trump and many others are like, we're not going to shut down even if we get another uh, a second wave. So I don't know. I don't know how you handle it as a church. I just know that we're going to do everything we can, if possible, to maintain services, uh, you know, with people actually here. If for some reason we, we, we can't, then obviously we will use the technology that is available to us to continue to teach and to continue to preach. Um, obviously, we will we'll, we'll have to see. Uh, with, a small, with a small church, um, that the good, the positive thing with a small church is, uh, we don't have a lot of the, 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 the uh, you know, high cost of, uh, you know, uh, the high overhead and, and expensive buildings to maintain and a large staff to try to pay. We don't have all of those problems. So financially, I think we're going to be okay where some churches are going to be in great danger. So that's one positive of a small church. Um, uh, another thing, a positive thing with a small church is we don't have to worry about all these, you know, trials. Trying, you know, how do we do we have to bring in three different services so we split our congregation up and and you know how do we do this? We're, we're small. We can we can everyone can separate enough and we should be okay no matter what the rules are. We should be okay. So th- those are all positives. The negative <laughs> before a small church is. During the COVID-19 situation, if another wave comes, um, it, you know, some people may not may feel uncomfortable showing up. Um, you get a couple of families not comfortable showing up, you're going to wipe out a Wednesday night. Boom, it's going to be gone. You're going to wipe out a Sunday night. Boom, it's going to be gone. If, if, if anyone obviously just feels a little sick, they're going to be obviously concerned. They don't want to, you know, bring it to church and spread it. So they may stay home and, 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 and times where maybe before they would like, ah, oh, you know, I think it's just allergies or I just think it's this and not worry about it. Now there'll be like extra concern. Well, again, you get a couple of families like that. You wipe out a Wednesday night, you wipe out a Sunday night, uh, service. So it's going to be a, a lot of interesting. I think, I think what may happen. I'm hoping it doesn't happen, but I think there may be some Wednesday nights where I have to revert right back to this kind of thing where I come out here to an empty building and teach. I'm I'm hoping that doesn't happen. We will see. I am grateful for the technology. I am grateful. I mean, you talk about we're here in the middle of nowhere, never had internet access. We start talking about it in December, I think December of 2019. We don't get ev- we don't get get everything set up. I think to start live streaming and get an internet connection in this building until I think February. I think it was February 2020. It may have been late January uh, 2020. And then the next thing you know, by March, boom, everything starts shutting down. You talk about it could not have all come together any better than it did to be able to to, to live stream. I mean. Uh, the fact that we started talking about it, and then there was like some back and forth. Should we get an internet connection? Shouldn't we? Is it worth it? And we kind of went back and forth and just, we went ahead and moved forward and then it all came together. So we've got some positives being a small church and we need to be grateful for that. We've got some negatives and that could make, um, you know, uh, each church service could be, uh, you know, from from a pastoral perspective, it could be very frustrating. Like, okay, 
Who's not coming tonight? Okay, who's not coming tonight? Oh boy, what do I do? What do I do? So I've got to be prepared to possibly teach with people present or to possibly teach with no one present. And so that's going to be an entry. Like now I just kind of know I'm coming to an empty building. So now I've kind of finally got into that mindset. It's still difficult, but I kind of got into that mindset. Now, if it's kind of a mixture, that will be bizarre and frustrating. So we will see, pray for churches all across the United States of America. As many churches are trying to, they've got to make decisions. Pastors have to make decisions. And, you know, and the way some people are is you've got many people in a church going, this whole thing is a hoax. It's all garbage. It's all the numbers have been exaggerated. Don't worry about it. This is nothing more than the flu. And they're like, let's meet. And then and many times a pastor will say, okay, we will. And then you get the news stories of, COVID-19 spread through church, pastor dies, priest dies, uh, 48 members of a choir all get sick, and I don't know how many possibly died there. Like, you see these stories, and you're kind of like, do we want to be that church? Do you want to be that church? So, but at the same time, if you're a pastor, if you got people yelling at you going, open up the church, open up, you're like, okay, I, you know, I, I, I've got to, and then when everyone gets sick, they'll be like, why did you open up the church? Why? You didn't care about us. You put us in danger. So it's like, if you open, someone's going to yell at you. If you don't open, someone's going to yell at you. And that's the wonderful uh, world of being a pastor. So far, I haven't had to deal with any of that. I've had no one yell or, or, yell or argue or threaten or challenge or anything along those lines. So I'm grateful for that. And hopefully, hopefully we can get back to a uh, normal, hopefully soon, hopefully starting Sunday, we can get back to normal and we'll see, we'll see what the, what is there, is there going to be a normal after COVID-19 or are we going to have to experience the new normal? We will see. I think uh, it'll be interesting for lots of churches, but I'm not here to talk about all of that, but I at least wanted to give it a few minutes people to realize that I was live on the air. All right, here we go. It's been an interesting day. Um, I came out here way early to get a lot of things recorded and craziness ensued. <laughs> okay, I'm live on the air. And the next thing you know, the front door of the church is opening and people are walking in and I'm like, what is going on? Well, because if, for those who were listening live earlier and heard everything that happened, uh, we were in the middle of a uh, a, a thunderstorm, and basically the thunderstorm turned into a hailstorm. Uh, I mean, uh, and there was a group of people on motorcycles, and they needed shelter. And so, to get out of the hailstorm, they just they saw my car in front of the church, and they went to the door and came in. And so I was like, "Got to end the live broadcast." That's it. So that messed that one up. Then I had to go back and redo that one. Wasn't happy about the redo, but at that point, I'd already spent what an hour and a half just trying to get one thing recorded. So, and then I did one for the VBC Bible Institute, which I wasn't super happy with. So nothing has gone well. So let's make tonight go well. All right. Maybe, 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 possibly. I know what you're saying. That's up to you. I know it is up to me. I've got to pull that off. So, all right, we've got a lot to do. So let's put this all together and hopefully, hopefully everyone can uh, benefit from it. All right, here we go. All right. Um, I know it's hard to believe, but this is part 10 part 10 of a series of messages that I have been calling Christian Growth and Victory. And I'm going back here and looking. The first message in this series, the first message in this series was March the 4th, 2020. March the 4th, 2020 was Christian Growth and Victory, okay? Now we're at May the 27th. Okay, so this mini series has been going on for a very long time, and we're we really don't have any end in sight. And and I I hope I don't know if anyone else is going to experience this. I hope that everyone else is is becoming as frustrated with the series as I am in preaching and teaching the series because I'm trying to articulate and express a frustration that you should feel about Christianity. And let me explain. In Christianity, over and over and over and over and over again, we are always given message after message after message. Here are the keys. Here are the keys for Christian victory. Here are the keys to grow as a Christian. Here's what you need to grow. Here are the things you need to be victorious. And then we're sold a Christianity that looks like, hey, if you're a Christian— and if you'll do all of these things, 
follow all of these steps, follow all of these keys, embrace all of these things, then boom, your Christian life is going to look powerful, victorious. It's going to look amazing. Follow them. So I said, okay, let's, let's take this concept and see what we can find. So we took a book that said, here are four keys to the Christian life. In fact, I think later on in the book, they give four more keys. They're like, they give you four keys. Then I think they go to a different subject and then they come back in the book going, wait a minute, I've discovered there are four more keys. So I think they give you a total of like eight keys. I can't remember the total number. Right now, we're just looking at four. And if you remember, the first one was very frustrating. The first key was what you need. If you're going to be victorious in your Christian life, you're going to grow. You have to abide in Christ. Sounds so good, right? Abide in Christ. And the way the book did it is pretty much, you know, they didn't really give us much of an explanation of what it meant. But hey, abide in Christ. And if you do, you're going to be victorious. You're going to grow. But no one can really articulate, is that something that happens subsequent to my salvation? Is abiding simply salvation? So if I'm simply saved, then I'm going to have a victorious life and grow? Like, like what? What, what, wait, how does this work? Do I do something? Do I not do something? Do I just abide by, by just being a Christian? And no one could really clarify that. We listened to, I, I analyzed, or I reviewed a number of sermons and analyzed a number of sermons on it, and each one became more frustrating than the next. It just, it, it, it was just crazy. Then we came to the next principle, putting off, putting on. If you want, if you want to grow as a Christian, if you want victory, you got to put off and you got to put on. And if you've been following the teaching in that section, which we're going to be back in tonight, if you start looking at it, you're like, how is this a key to victory? Because all of the put off, put on, put off, put on. If you start looking at it, you realize how, how, how bad you fail at the putting off and putting on. So if this is the key to Christian growth and Christian victory, you realize you're going to be defeated a large portion of your Christian life. You're like, wait, if I'm going to, if I'm going to be victorious, I have to put off and I have to put on. Now, there's no question the putting off and putting on is a part of Christianity, but I'm saying to say that it's a key for victory and growth just seems like it's one that's going to be perpetually frustrating, at least from my perspective. And we'll, we'll go back over them, but I just want to show you how common this theme is. All right. So I, it got about 6 p.m. It got about 6 p.m. out here at Victory Baptist Church. And I was like, man, I wish I could just go ahead and start right at 6 p.m. and just get done. Because if I, if I try to record something else, then I'm not, I'm, I'm, I'm not going to be ready to go at 7. And so I was like, it, I, I was stuck in one of those weird times when I come out here so early that all I can do is kind of just sit here and go, what do I do? What do I do? What do I do? So I said, okay, I don't want to waste any time. I'll grab my iPad, look at the bazillion podcasts that I subscribe to, find one that deals, you know, with Christianity and just hit play. So I found one, hit play, and guess what I hear? Eight, eight essentials. If I really, if I'm going to survive, they wanted to relate it to the COVID-19 situation. Here are eight essentials. If I'm going to survive COVID-19, if I'm going to survive this, I need eight essentials. So is it four? Is it eight? Is it 10? Is it 12? Every Christian pastor for 2,000 years has always come up with, here are the things you need. Here are the things you need. And and I want to make sure you understand what goes with the eight keys, eight essentials, four keys, seven essentials, whatever. And I don't know how many different books I have on my bookshelf of four keys, seven keys, 10 keys. I don't know. There are, there's all of them. And as a young Christian, I would buy every one thinking I need this. Okay. If I would do this, if I will do this, but I want to make sure you hear this. All of the books have one, th- even though they may not agree on what the keys are and what the essentials are, they all have this in common. They sell you a picture of Christianity that's like, if you do this, look at you, you're going to be victorious and you're going to have all this power and you're going to have all this strength and God's going to work through you and you're going to overcome sin and you're going to be great and you're going to be nice and you're going to love people and you're never going to have an argument with your spouse and your kids are going to praise you and everything's going to be one. They, they almost give you this picture of Christianity and nobody, and when you look at the picture, everybody's like, that's what I want my life to look like. And then you strive and strive and strive and don't get it. And then it's like, well, you didn't follow the keys. You didn't follow the, you didn't follow the essentials. 
order my DVD for $24.95 and you can do it, you know, or, or no, you can't do it. God will do it for you. But if God's doing it for me and I don't have to do anything, then why isn't it happening? Right. Because sometimes a lot of Christians will say that, you see, you've been trying too hard. You stop trying and God will do it through you. So then you sit down, grab a Dr. Pepper, a bag of Doritos. You sit down. You're like, OK, all right, God, go to it. And you're like, well, man, it doesn't really seem to be working. And then you go back to and But the Christian leaders, after they've sold you the book, I mean, they're peace out. I mean, you know. They don't have to face you face to face and you look at them and go, you know, I read your book and I followed your eight keys and, and my Christian life is kind of a mess. Well, you know, it's it's on you, but they're, they're nowhere to be found because they already got your money for the book. So it's frustrating. So I thought what I would do tonight, I want to get to, I want to get to uh, the, the putting off and putting on back to Ephesians 4. I want to get back to that um, because I think it's very important. Um, because we, we've come to, we're come to a very interesting one. And the reason the next one is interesting is it's straight up, you know, from the Ten Commandments in a sense. It's basically straight law. So then you have to, this gets into a whole theological discussion. So are you telling me the, uh, the key to my Christian growth is law? If I follow the law, what the law is supposed to condemn, like, so now this gets into a whole issue uh, about how you perceive the Christian life. But I'm going to play a little bit of what I heard today just to see how it starts. We'll see how far it goes. Um, I'm not, I was going to just use this completely for the whole message tonight, but I'm not happy with it because the volume level, I don't know, I don't know what they were doing with their recording. Um, those who are listening, members of Victory Baptist Church, you can uh, speak in the chat if you think it's too low. Um, and then I won't play that much of it. But, um, if you if you're using a Bluetooth speaker, you can obviously uh, turn it up and probably hear it better that way. If you're using your phone speaker, I, I yeah yeah I don't I don't know how well this is going to work, but I just want you to hear it because again this I didn't go looking for it. Just here it is on a podcast. Boom! Oh, there we go. Eight essentials. Eight essentials. And note how he starts. He sells it. He sells it, and you're gonna and you know you probably already know what passage he's going to use to sell. You know how your Christian life can be. So let's just listen to this just to, because it goes along with what we've been talking about. This, what does the Christian life look like? What, what does Christian victory look like? What does Christian growth look like? Is there any secret key? Is there a secret formula to it? Or have we been basically lied to most of our Christian lives? I mean, I've been lied to. I know you've been lied to. Or have we been told the truth and just... For some reason, the members of Victory Baptist Church can't figure it out, including their pastor. Maybe maybe we need the, you know, Christian growth and victory for VBC dummies. Okay, maybe we need to, I need to write a book that, Christian growth and victory for VBC dummies, okay? Because all the other churches have got it all figured out. I guess we're the dummies who, who, who can't figure it out. I don't know. All right, but let's listen to this, and I think you'll get an idea. I mean, this is straight out of the playbook of modern-day Christianity. Here we go. Maybe you're extremely frustrated by what's going on in our world today. Pastor John Randall shares this encouraging word. Folks, listen, maybe you've come to the place where you're saying, Pastor, I can't do this anymore. I can't take another week. I can't take another month. I can't take another day. And let me tell you something. The truth is we can't in our own strength. But listen, friend, you can do all things through Christ who gives you strength. During this COVID crisis, our governing officials have come out with a list of what's essential. I'm sure you're well aware by now of what those are. Pastor John Randall would like to take this opportunity to share with us eight things that are essential for the believer. Now, these are things we have access to right now and can sustain you in this or really any crisis. So turn, if you would, to 2 Peter chapter 1, and let's see what those are on this very special edition of A Daily Walk. We've seen. All right, I'm going to interrupt right there. You you see how it 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 starts out. Hey, you have got the strength. You can do all things through Christ, which strengthens you. You've got some kind of supernatural strength to live out the Christian life. Now, again, obviously ripping Philippians 4:13 out of its immediate context because context no longer matters, but just you already get the idea what he's going to do. Here are eight things that we have access to right now. Now, I, I just cannot, and this goes right back to our whole theme here that we've now on, on part 10, we've been looking at this for a long time. 
This is, this is what drives me crazy about the whole subject of Christian victory and living out the Christian life. Christians claim we preach, we sell Christianity. If you become a Christian, you have access to things that poor lost soul doesn't. And we always seem to indicate that what we have is a strength, a supernatural power. And then you look at Christianity and go, where is the strength and the supernatural power? So I always get about it. But I'm going to play a little bit more of this. No one is complaining too much about the um, – um, nobody uh, Nobody seems to be complaining too much about the volume. So um, I'm going to go along with it and play some of this. And, and maybe we'll just go with this. We'll see. It's not that long. Um, it's a pretty short message. Uh, but he's going to give us eight things. I think he said Second Peter chapter 1. If I remember correctly, that's where he said. So if you have a Bible, have Ephesians 4 open in case we get back there. Uh, Second Peter, I think he said Second Peter chapter 1. I believe that's what he said. So I'm going to Second Peter chapter 1. If not, we'll switch back over to First Peter chapter 1. But I think it's Second Peter chapter 1. And uh, we'll see where he goes. Eight essentials. This goes right along with this idea. Hey, here's the eight things you need. And he, and he ties it back. I mean, it's a very common thing in preaching. You want to tie what you're preaching to to things that are relevant. Everyone's talking about COVID-19. Everyone's talking about the pandemic. So he's basically like, here are the eight things you need to live out your Christian life. And it's implied in a victorious, overcoming way. And the way you're going to do it is there's eight essential things that you have access to right now. And boom, that's going to let you do it because you can do all things. That's that's the message. So it it applies to what we've been looking at. But we'll just kind of we'll just kind of see a, another example of this idea. So let's see where, what he says. Seen all the numbers on the news. We've seen the statistics on the screens, the medical data from the doctors. And we've sought to flatten the curve of the coronavirus. We've also observed an ever widening division within our country. We've seen fierce political feuds erupt over funding from the federal government. And while we have quarantined in our quarters, worn our masks, washed our hands, sanitized every surface imaginable, we are ready to get back to living our lives. And depending upon which state you live in, And who your governor is will determine when you can go back to work, back to school, and back to church. But the truth is, we don't always know what the truth is. We understand that the virus among us is real. We don't know to what degree it will affect us. And because of the conflicting reports, some are living in fear, while others are living in frustration as their families are impacted, as their businesses have been closed, and their livelihood has been dramatically affected. And then there are those who perhaps are doing their best to inform us what is essential and what isn't essential. But there's a deeper question that has surfaced, and that is this. Who gets to determine what is essential? Because what may be essential for one person may not be essential for another. All of us are in the same storm, but not necessarily all in the same boat. And this morning, it's not my intention to reiterate discouraging news editorials, nor to debate political positions, but instead to turn our attention to what is essential for the believer in Jesus Christ. And I want to begin by reading to you a powerfully uplifting passage found in the book of 2 Peter chapter 1. In 2 Peter chapter 1, we find that the church to which Peter was writing was going through a very difficult time of testing. They were being refined through the fiery trials of persecution. Nevertheless, he reminded them that they had everything that they needed, everything that was essential to make it through. And here in 2 Peter chapter 1 and verse 2, it reads this way. Grace and peace be multiplied to you in the knowledge of God and of Jesus our Lord. And then he says in verse 3, as his divine power has given to us all things 
that pertain to life and godliness through the knowledge of him who called us by glory and virtue, by which have been given to us exceedingly great and precious promises that through these we may be the partakers of divine nature, having escaped the corruption that is in this world through lust. The passage before us says, folks, listen, we read it all things that pertain to life and godliness have been given to us. That means the essentials that we need to thrive are readily available. And I want to give to you eight essentials that you have access to right now that will sustain you through this national crisis. And I'll say sustain you through any crisis that you might go through in your life. Number one, in case you were unaware and didn't know, now you do. Jesus is essential. Can I get an amen on that? (laughs) Jesus is essential. The Bible says in John chapter one, verse four, in Jesus was life and the life was the light of men. Jesus said in John chapter 14, verse six, I am the way, the truth and the life. And no one comes to the father except through me. In 1 John chapter 5, it says, he who has the son has life and he who does not have the son does not have life. The Bible tells us very clearly we can do all things through Christ who strengthens us. Folks, listen, maybe you've come to the place where you're saying, Pastor, I can't do this anymore. I can't take another week. I can't take another month. I can't take another day. And let me tell you something. The truth is we can't in our own strength. But listen, friend, you can do all things through Christ who gives you strength. Can, can I just ask you to do something right now? If you're sitting with somebody in the car next to you, could you look to them or maybe it's the person beside you and say to them, I can do all things through Christ who gives me strength. Just right now, say it to the person sitting with you. Look at them and tell them, hey, I can do all things through Christ who gives me strength. Remind yourself of that. The Bible says in him, we live, we move, and we have our being. The Bible says when Christ, who is our life, appears, then we shall appear with him in glory. Paul said, for me to live is Christ and to die is gain. <laughs> what what can, what can you say anymore? What can you say? Yeah, you look at the person next to you. I can do all things, all things, all things. Now he doesn't clarify, doesn't in any way put any parameters around it. All things, and then you know he just he's just quoting one scripture after another scripture after another scripture. No context, nothing given. He's got some scriptures referring to when Christ comes back. He's got some scriptures that possibly refer to now, and it, and it's just basically what he's saying is you Jesus is essential. You have Jesus because you have Jesus. You you can't do it in yourself, but He's going to give you the strength to do what. And everyone's supposed to say all things. All things, all things, all things. And of course, any person with any brain cells will go, wait a minute, all things can't mean all things because there's all kinds of things I cannot do. Let me give you one. Stop sinning, period. No more sin. Well, he's not, I mean, I can do all things, but I can't do that thing, okay, right? You know, I, I, I can't, I can't do that thing. That's the thing I can't do, all right? Okay, you know, I would do anything for love, but I won't do that. Okay, okay, we won't go back to that song and we could analyze those lyrics, but we won't go there. But you get the idea, like like every Christian sitting in, in their cars, wherever, it, you know, it sounds like there's some people there. Maybe he's doing, uh, maybe that's why the sound is so bad. He's doing one of those drive-in services where everybody's sitting in the car, have their windows down, taking selfies because, you know, that proves that they were at church or something. I don't know, but but. Everyone sitting there, if, if, I mean, why wouldn't someone just raise their hand or honk their horn and go, Hey, pastor, wait a minute. If I can do all things, why do I keep sinning? Are you saying that I don't have to sin because I, uh, because I have the strength not to? So it's because I don't want to. Like, what, what do you tell, what, what are you telling me? But almost, almost all Christians of all theological persuasions uh, state that no, we cannot be perfect. Almost all Christians of pretty much all from all walks of life say that, no, you can't be perfect. We're always going to sin. No one is perfect. While at the same time screaming at everyone, you can do all things. Look at the person next to you and say all things. Well, that's not. And again, this is essential to living out your Christian life. 
now, if that's the essential to a victorious Christian life is for me to realize I can't, but, but I have Jesus and in Jesus I can do all things, then guess what? You're, you're selling a Christianity. You're selling a life that no one is ever going to experience because they're being told I can do all things and then they realize they can't do all things. They, they, they can't, you know, be perfect. They can't stop sinning. They can't do all the things the scriptures calls us to do. They can't. They can't love God with all their heart. They can't, they can't, they can't, they can't. And you're like, well, so they either, they, either they have to believe they can, but they don't want to. And after enough of that, that I can't, that I don't want to, I don't want to, I don't want to, then at some point you're going to realize, well, I guess I'm just not a Christian. And then you walk away from the faith. Like th- this sound, like they, they act like it's encouraging, but for any thoughtful person, it's not encouraging. I can do all things, but I can't stop sinning. Well, that's, I can't, I can't, just think of all the things you cannot do. It's, it's just, but this is, this is Christianity. And this is, again, being sold as an essential to live out your Christian life. This is a key, the key. You need Jesus. You have Jesus. And because you have Jesus, you have the strength to do all things. Yeah, I, I, I don't think it works that way. It, it, I mean, look at Christian history. Obviously, it doesn't. Do you understand this morning that Jesus is essential, that he alone can provide what you need? Without Jesus, I am nothing. Without Jesus, I am lost. Without Jesus, I have no hope. But with Jesus, I have all things that I need. And so do you. Jesus is essential. But secondly... God's word is essential. And why is God's word essential? First and foremost, because it's God's word. The Bible is God's revelation of himself and of his will. The Bible tells the story of the creator and his creation. It shares how that human beings are capable of great things, but also of sinful things. And it shows how much the creator cares for his wayward creation and what he has done to rescue us. The Bible tells of how Jesus, Israel's long-awaited king, was born humbly and how he loved and served and came to save the world. It tells us that he calls all people to repent, to turn from their sin. The Bible tells the story of Jesus' life, death, and resurrection and ascension and how he came to save mankind from an eternity apart from God. In the Bible, we learn that Jesus promised that all who turn from their sin and accept by faith Jesus as their Savior will have eternal life. Friends, listen today. Jesus is essential and God's word is essential. Jesus said it. Man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceeds from the mouth of God. It was Jeremiah the prophet that declared concerning God's word, your words were found and I ate them and your word to me was the joy and rejoicing of my heart because I'm called by your name, O Lord God of hosts. The psalmist declared, my soul clings to the dust. Revive me according to your word because it's essential. In Hebrews chapter four, it says, the word of the Lord is living and it's powerful and it's sharper than any two-edged sword, even piercing to the division of the soul and spirit, the joints and marrow, and is a discerner of the thoughts and the intents of the heart. God's word is essential. The Bible says the word of the Lord endures forever. God's word is essential. God's word is essential because it's filled with God's promises. And we know that God keeps his promises. And as we meditate on the words of the Lord, our hearts are uplifted. God's word is essential because it enables us to look above and beyond the COVID crisis and see that our Lord is high and lifted up and he is seated on the throne and he is in control. God's word is essential because it directs our attention upward instead of downward. God's word is essential because it increases our faith over our fears. God's word is essential because it brings life and healing. The Bible says he sent forth his word and he healed them. God's word is essential because it provides hope and comfort for those who are hurting today. God's word is essential because it provides the truth that we need to cut through all the lies that surround us. His word is truth. God's word is essential because it gives us strength to overcome temptation and sin that so easily ensnares us. Have these troubling times brought you to the place where you realize like never before 
how valuable and how completely essential the Word of God is. You know, I have realized in this season that there are things that I can live without, but one thing that I cannot live without is the Word of God. God's Word is essential. Jesus is essential. God's Word is essential. But you know something else? Now, obviously, no one can argue with his statement that God's word is essential. You can't. Now, he threw in that little idea that with God's word, we, have, we get strength to overcome temptation. Again, you have to put some, I don't know why Christians never put any qualifier when they make those statements. Hey, this will give you the strength to overcome, but you're not going to be able to do it perfectly. That means there's a limit to the strength it gives. So we, on one hand, we sell it, a one way, and then the reality is something different. It's like it's like a, a messed up info commercial. Hey, you, if you have Jesus and you have the Word, you have the strength and the power to overcome and to not sin. However, wait, read the fine print. You're going to continue to sin the rest of your life. Well, then, then why you why are you selling it like then we can? Can we or can't we? So, but no one no one can criticize that we need God's Word. But I just want you to see something that's very ironic here or, or very telling. He's all about God's word. We need God's word. God's word's essential. God, God's word is essential. God's word is essential. But notice how he handled God's word. Where did all of this start? Started in 2 Peter chapter 1, right? We read these words. 2 Peter chapter 1 verse 2, grace and peace be multiplied unto you through the knowledge of God and of Jesus our Lord. Now, he did give us a little historical background to 2 Peter. We have to applaud that. That's a good thing. Then in verse 3, according as his divine power hath given unto us all things that pertain unto life and godliness through the knowledge of him that hath called us to glory and virtue, whereby we are given unto us exceeding great and precious promises, that by these ye might be partakers of the divine nature, having escaped the corrupt corruption that is in the world through lust. Now let's stop right there. Here's God's word that he talks about is so wonderful, so wonderful, so essential, so great. And I'm glad he's praising it, right? I'm glad he's, he's elevating uh, uh, God's word. That's all wonderful, okay? But that's the kind of thing that sounds good, but look what he did with Second Peter. He read it, but... Let me ask you some basic questions of 2 Peter chapter 1, verse 3. Let me just, uh, uh, you may want to write down these questions. As according, as according as his divine power hath given unto us all things that pertain unto life and godliness. When Peter is telling them that uh, according to the divine power, when he says he's given us all things that pertain unto life and godliness, what are the things he's referring to? All things that refer to life and godliness. What does he mean? What, what does that mean? What, what, like what, what, what does that mean? Do, does anybody even have a guess? What, what does that, he's given to us all things that to pertain to life and godliness. Does that mean in life I'm going to have everything I need? Well, you've got to be careful. There's Christians who live in third world nations who don't, okay? So what does that, exactly what does that mean? What, what, what does he mean? And godliness, what does that mean? Now, is this speaking of godliness from a positional standpoint or a practical standpoint? What does it mean? He, did, he didn't even bother to try to articulate that in any way, shape, or form. He did nothing to answer that question. So when it says we've been given um, unto us all things that pertain unto life and godliness, what are those things? Okay, what does it mean um, that we may be partakers of the divine nature? What does it mean that we are partakers of the divine nature? So what are the all things that we have been given that pertain to uh, life and godliness? Number two, what does it mean to be partakers of the divine nature? And number three, what does it mean escape the corruption that is in the world through lust? What does it mean escaping that? So three questions. Number one, what are the all things given to us that pertains to life and godliness? Number two, what does it mean to be a partaker of the divine nature? And number three, what does it mean escape the corruption that is in the world through lust? How, how have you, how, how have I, how have they, that Peter is writing to, escape the corruption? 
Those are three basic questions. Three basic questions. Now, if anyone has a study Bible, well, I'll, I'll, we'll do this, especially in the chat. If anyone has a study Bible, does your study Bible have a note answering any one of those questions? Does your study Bible have a note answering those questions? If so, you can take a screenshot and post it right there in the chat. Does Do you have a study Bible that gives you any, even a hint at an answer for any of those questions? Right? Anything. Anything. If, if, you, if, you, if it's a no, at least answer in the chat that it's a no. All right? Okay, you can answer if it's a no. I'm going to look really quick at something. Because he didn't even attempt to try to answer it. He didn't even attempt. Second Peter chapter 1. Okay. I'm looking here. All right, now, what I'm reading here is um, just as a normal baby is born with all the equipment he needs for life and only needs to grow, so the Christian has all that he needed and only needs to grow. Just as a baby has a definite genetic structure that determines how he will grow, so the, the believer is genetically structured to experience glory and virtue, one day he will be like the Lord. All right? Um, yeah. That doesn't really tell us much. <laughs> so that, that doesn't really tell, tell me much. That just says, hey, we have everything we need for life and godliness. Um, and I think what they, oh, it looks like what they are referring to, that we have everything that, uh, that we have everything that relates to life and godliness in the sense that we have been raised from spiritual death into spiritual life. We now have spiritual life. And I don't know about the godliness part. I don't know if they mean that positionally. Or practically, does does anyone else have any notes that even attempts to answer that in any way, shape, or form? Because I think in many cases, we're going to get some very vague answers. No study Bible. Seth doesn't have a study Bible. Okay. If no one else answers, then, then I'll move on. But what I want you to see is that in many cases, your study Bible, even in your commentaries, when you read a verse like that, they either they either sell it like, hey, you got everything you need. You got everything you need, or they don't really explain it. Okay, uh, Brenda, no. Let's see if Diane is a no. I'm waiting for those listening who are not members of Victory Baptist Church. We'll see. Nothing in our study Bible. So, so no, in other words, those are three basic questions that should derive that should arise arise from that text. He preaching them. He now he uses it to jump off, right? He 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 read them like, hey, see, you've got everything you need. You got everything you need, and here are the essentials you need. Here are the you need Jesus, and you have Jesus, and with Jesus comes strength. Hey, you need the Word of God. You have the Word of God. With the Word of God, you get the strength to overcome sin and temptation. So already, just with the first two essentials, at this point, I mean. I don't know why we have any problems. I don't know why we have any problems. And again, the, the text itself, if, if the Bible is so important, why didn't he just stay there in 2 Peter 1 and tr- try to help us understand what in the world that's talking about? We have everything that we need pertaining to life and godliness. Okay, what, what is that referring to? We're partakers of the divine nature. What does that mean? We've escaped the corruption? What, what does that mean? Because that all sounds like a Christian life that I'm not, I'm not used to experiencing. Like, what, what is that referencing? That's the kind of thing that drives me crazy about so much of, of preaching. We've got to ask, and, and, and what many preachers do, they just sell it like, hey, guys, you've got all of this. This is the reality, while ignoring, while, while ignoring the true reality of the lives of the people is sitting in the pew in front of them, and the pastor ignoring the reality of his own life. All right, let's see what other essentials he gives us. Prayer is essential. Prayer is talking to God like you would talk to your best friend. It's opening up your heart to God, the God that loves you, the God that created you. And we are both invited and encouraged to pray. The Bible says to pray without ceasing, that men ought always to pray and not lose heart, to pray in faith, to pray without wrath and doubting, to pray earnestly. 
consistently, faithfully, and fervently. It's the prayer of the righteous person that avails much. God's power at work through prayer. The Bible says, let us come boldly to the throne of grace that we might obtain help in time of need. How do we do that? Through prayer. In Jeremiah, the prophet declared in Jeremiah 33, call unto me and I will answer you and I will show you great and mighty things which you do not know. God gives you the invitation. The door is open. Heaven is wide open, friend, for you. Find that uh, promise in Jeremiah 33. I think he said Jeremiah 33. Let's see if we can find it. Jeremiah 33. They're going to be experts in being able to hear when preachers do this kind of nonsense. Jeremiah 33. All right, let's see if we can. Yes, Jeremiah 33. Let's go to verse one. Jeremiah 33, verse one. Jeremiah 33, verse one. I'll wait for everyone to get there. Jeremiah 33, verse one. Let's go here. Jeremiah 33, verse one. Moreover, the word of the Lord came unto Jeremiah the second time while he was yet shut up in the court of the prison. So here is the word comes to Jeremiah, a real person, a real historical situation. Where is he at? He's shut up in the court of the prison. Verse two, thus saith the Lord, the maker thereof, the Lord that formed it to establish it. The Lord is his name. Call unto me and I will answer thee and show thee great and mighty things which thou knowest not. For thus saith the Lord, the God, the God of Israel concerning the houses of this city and concerning the houses of the kings of Judah, which are thrown down by the mounts and by the sword. They come to fight with the Chaldeans, but it is to fill them with the dead bodies of men. Behold, I will bring it health and cure. And at verse six, he is taught and I will cause the captivity of Judah and the captivity of Israel to return and will build them as the first. He's calling on Jeremiah to call on God and he will answer and he's going to do mighty things which he knoweth not. He's going to bring back the people from captivity. He's going to restore them. There's going to be a covenant made. There's all these promises made, dealing with land and dealing with everything else. Those are the promises. And he just took that, ripped it out of its historical context and then gives it to you, right? And then, and just think of someone sitting at home going through a, a difficult time. They're, they're listening to a podcast. Everything's falling apart in their life. COVID-19, losing their job, whatever. And they're like, they write it on their refrigerator. If I call, call unto God, he's going to answer me. He's going to show me great and mighty things which I do not know. That's how they're going to paraphrase it. They're going to put it on the refrigerator. They're going to name it. They're going to claim it. And then they're not going to get it. And then they get disillusioned or they think that they didn't have enough faith. Because your name is not Jeremiah. Because your name is not Israel and Judah. Because you're not in Babylonian captivity. Same garbage, different day. It's so like it's like could 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 these preachers come up with something new? But but this is the thing. It goes right with, hey, what do you need for Christian growth and victory? Do you, do we need the Bible? Absolutely. We do need the Bible. Yes, we do. All right? But but do you just paraphrase it and rip verses out of context? No, you need to show me what, See, this is the thing. You give someone a key but don't even explain how the key works. Okay? I need to know what I need to do with the scriptures, right? Okay? We, we've been looking at four keys and we're, we started in March and here we are in May and we're still working on the second key. He's going through eight in tw- like 25 minutes. What are people going to do with these? And, and there's no explanation of, wait a minute, how this works. Problem. Just pray and boom, you get. And it doesn't work that way. And anyone who's been a Christian for any length of time knows it doesn't work that way. You, you know. And what? Okay, here we go. You to come and seek the Lord. And over the last month, we have been praying. We have been interceding for God to pour out his spirit in greater measure. Folks, listen, this pandemic has become the training ground for developing an army of prayer warriors. And I pray that you're one of them. I pray that that's exactly what you're experiencing through prayer. The church is being refined through prayer. The church is being revived. We have been reminded in this season. Is... (laughs) The church is being purified and being revived. 
Does he have any proof of that at all? Any, any at all, any. Now, now there may be individual Christians who may get purified and maybe experience revival, but to say the church, is he speaking of his church alone or is he speaking of the church in general? Well, there's all, I mean, obviously, I, where, where, revival. If I hear another preacher talk about revivals coming, revivals coming, revivals coming, revivals coming, like, and, and in many cases they go against their own eschatology, which says in the in the latter times many will depart from the faith, turning to, to you know doctrines of demons and seducing spirits, and many are going to fall away. Like we have all these warnings about things getting worse and worse and worse, but yet we have preachers constantly saying a revivals coming, revivals coming, revivals coming, revivals coming, revivals coming, revivals coming. It's like I. And and for every 9,000 sermons that says revival's coming, 10 years later, where is the supposed revival? Where is, and then they'll point to some mega church. Yeah, that's heretical, but whatever. But again, it's this idea, pray, 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 and you're going to get, 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 get. That's the implication, whether it's explicitly said or if it's implied. Hey, call on God. He's going to show you great and wonderful things. He's going to do great and wonderful things. And it doesn't work that way. It doesn't. If you, it doesn't. God can intervene sometimes. Sometimes he doesn't. Sometimes you pray, 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 and the person doesn't get better. The person uh, dies. The, uh, the, the job doesn't come back. The financial situation gets worse. The, the relationship falls apart. It, it, it doesn't, it doesn't work that way. And, and, but we sell Christianity one way. And that's what's wrong with all of these key, these little, here's how the Christian life works. And, and we, it's all based off a selling of a Christianity that doesn't actually exist in real life. And either you have to continue to convince yourself that it is happening when it's not, or you become disillusioned and give up of that passage of scripture that declares this. If my people who are called by my name will humble themselves and pray and seek my face and turn from their wicked ways, then I will hear from heaven and I will forgive their sin and heal their land. And we have responded to that exhortation and we are calling upon the name of the Lord. We are turning from our wicked ways and we're looking to the God of heaven. Listen, friend, you may not have a direct line to Washington, but you have direct Everybody knows what passage he's referencing there. But if you turn from your wicked ways, repent, call on him, God will heal, heal the nation. Everybody know what passage that is? I'll look in the chat. Does everybody know where that is? See who can find it. Does anybody know where that passage is? It's in the Old Testament, so I can save you time. See who can find it first. I'm going to wait. Going to wait. Going to wait. Who can find it? I'm going to wait. I'm waiting. <laughs> I'm going to keep waiting. See who can answer first. I'm going to keep waiting. <laughs> Who can find it? Oh, Twyla's there. Let's see if she's going to answer it. Second Chronicles. Very good. Second Chronicles chapter seven. I originally thought it was chapter six. So I was getting nervous that I had the wrong book. Okay. Second Chronicles chapter seven, verse 14 if my people, which are called by my name, shall humble themselves and pray and seek my face and turn from their wicked ways, then will I hear from heaven and will forgive their sin and will heal their land. If you go back to verse 12, note Second Chronicles chapter 7, verse 12, And the Lord appeared to Solomon by night and said unto him, I have heard thy prayer and have chosen this place to myself for an house of sacrifice. If I shut up heaven, that there be no rain, or if I command the locusts to devour the land, or if I send pestilence among my people. So he's clearly speaking about Israel, right? He's clearly speaking about Israel. And 
Um, and yeah, thank you, uh, Stacy. Yeah, there's a, there's a big, for those who are not members of Victory Baptist Church, there's a big lag. So when I ask for something, that's why it takes a long time for someone to answer in the chat. It's not that the people in my church ignore me. I mean, they probably are ignoring me, but, um, there is a lag. So that, that's, that's possibly why. So, but please note, just go back 13. This verse 13 never, never gets quoted with verse 14. Never, never. Now, remember, the Bible is so important. The Bible is essential. The Bible is essential. But we're not going to take the time to even look at the context. Again, verse 12, 2 Chronicles 7, 12, And the Lord appeared to Solomon by night and said unto him, I have heard thy prayer and have chosen this place to myself for a house of sacrifice. All right? Okay? Dealing Israel, dealing with the temple. And then what he says, If I shut up heaven that there be no rain, or if I command the locusts to devour the land, or if I send pestilence among my people, this is clearly a reference to Israel, right? Clearly a reference to Israel. Then look at what happens in verse 14. If my people, the people that God sends those things upon, those plagues upon, which are called by my name, shall humble themselves and pray and seek my face and turn from the wicked ways, then will I hear from heaven and I will forgive their sins and will heal their land. Now, I want to make sure we get this. If we take this passage like he just does and rip it completely out of its context and apply it to us, then I want to make sure this is how this would be interpreted. Listen to me. If my people, if Christians, which are called my by my name, Christians, shall humble themselves, Christians, not the world, not the ungodly, if Christians will do these things, if they will pray, if they will seek his face, if they will turn from their wicked ways, then God will heal their land. Well, every time destruction has come upon the world, guess whose fault it is? It's Christians, because according to this verse, the way Christians apply it, if we would simply humble ourselves, repent, and call on God, God would heal the land. So, hey, don't complain about politicians shutting everything down. Blame the church, because if the church would have stopped worrying about conspiracy theories and have repented and prayed, God would have healed the land from COVID-19. When people are dying in World War II, it was the church's fault because the church wouldn't follow 2 Chronicles 7, verse 14. Christians never preach it that way. We almost act like, tell the world that they need to repent and get right with God. No, the church needs to get right with God. Then God would heal the land. So everything that's ever happened in the world, every pestilence, every famine, every war, war, everything that's destroyed people, it's the fault of the stinking church. But nobody wants to preach it that way. Wait, I thought it's a promise that if we do it, God will heal the land. Well, I guess Christians don't care. I guess Christians don't care. Hey, Christians, it's all your fault that 100,000 people in America have died. It's your fault, Christians. This is supposedly an encouraging message. Second Chronicles chapter 7, verse 14 should make you sick to your stomach. It's your fault that 100,000 people are dead. It's your fault that people starve to death in Africa and, and, and other parts of the world where there's famine and pestilence and disease. It's your fault because you haven't repented and you haven't called on God. But no, we don't preach it that way. We don't preach it that way. No, of course not. Of course not. Just some little thing that we throw out. But see, we, but we, it's based off the premise that, hey, we, we have access to do this. No, that's, that was God talking to Solomon, specifically those people. If, if, and again, it goes back to Deuteronomy where God tells the people, hey, if you do this, you're going to get a blessing. If you don't, you're going to get a curse. If you do this, your crops are going to grow. Everything's going to go. If you don't, you're going to get all the, that was a, that's a theocracy Think God working things out for Israel. Is there a principle there? Maybe so, but there's not a promise that, hey, if all the Christians will get together and if we'll pray and we'll repent and we'll turn from our wicked ways, then everything in the land is going to be great. No. What are you talking? And even then it would be, the pestilence would be, it would be, it would even be, in fact, in, in fact, if we want to go even a step further and try to even be more consistent with a very literal interpretation, if we're going to apply it to Christians, it would only refer to when a plague or, or these problems come upon Christians, not upon the world, just upon Christians. So I, 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 where was the early church when they were being, uh, you know, 
drug out of their homes and killed? Why didn't they just repent and pray and God would have healed their land? It's talking about the land of Israel. Oh, it's so sad. So sad. So sad. All right, let's finish this. Direct access to heaven. We may not be able to get the attention of our governor, but we have the attention of almighty God. Prayer is essential. Amen? Prayer is essential. Prayer is essential because through prayer we discover God's will instead of our own. Prayer is essential for it's through prayer that we bring our... I don't know if you caught it. Prayer is essential because we discover God's will. There's that... You see, selling a Christianity, you can know God's will. How? You pray, you pray, you pray. And then boom! Da-da-da-da-da! I know God's will. Yeah. And that's why Christians pray, think they know God's will, and then they never ever, ever live it out, or they turn from it, or they change it, and blah. Give me a break. It doesn't work that way. You know God's will from his word, not from prayer, okay? You don't hear from God in prayer. You hear from God in studying his word, okay? But you see, this is all selling a, 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 a victorious path to, a, a, a path to supposedly a victorious Christian life that so far has been just, it's going to just leave people disillusioned, frustrated, and feel like that the whole, they were sold a, 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 a broken down car. They were sold something that doesn't work. They were sold a fraudulent um, product. Petitions and needs to the Lord. Prayer is essential because it's the way that we overcome anxiety and worry. Prayer is essential because it's through prayer that I praise God and I thank him for his faithful provision. Prayer is essential because it makes us more like Jesus. It's essential because it reveals the heart of God and it provides the wisdom of God. And we can have confidence in prayer that if we ask anything according to his will, we know that he hears us. He hears you today. I pray because I can't help myself. I pray because the need flows out of me all the time, waking and sleeping. Prayer doesn't change God. You know what prayer does? It changes me. A prayerless Christian is a powerless Christian. And I do believe that through this crisis, God is teaching his people once again how to pray. Jesus is essential. God's word is essential. Prayer is essential. Now, the prayerless Christian is a powerless Christian is a good bumper sticker. Everybody can get the T-shirt. And we can sell the T-shirts, make a lot of money. But again, it's, it's, a, it's, it's a statement, right? Just as an emphatic, dogmatic fact, all right? So here I am, you're the Christian, you pray. Boom, you got power. Here's your coworker, they don't pray. They have no power. Okay, what power are you referring to? What power do you have that your prayerless lost person doesn't have? Or even if you take two Christians, two Christians, all right. Christian one prays, 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 pray. Christian two doesn't pray or prays very, very little. Right. So he's the powerless Christian. You're the powerful one. How do, where does the power show up? Where does the power show up? What do you mean by power? Do you have the ability to sin less than the one that pray, that doesn't pray? Do you have the ability to understand the uh, Bible more than the one who uh, doesn't pray? What, what, what power do you possess? See, we always talk power. You get power. You got power. You got power. How do you live the Christian life? You tap into the power. How do you have victory? You tap into the power. We talk so much about power, and then you look around and like, where's the power? Because we look just as broken down as everyone else. This is the thing that drives some people to despair and want to quit Christianity. This leads people to go, wait, what? I don't get it. It's not the way it's being sold. But they, no matter no matter how many people get disillusioned with the product, the, 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 the car salesmen keep going out there selling and selling and selling and selling until they get a new person to buy into it. And then that person buys into it. And either they live a life of delusion where they pretend that things are a way that they're not, or they become disillusioned and then they, 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 they fall to the wayside. You know, and again, it's one thing to say hey, prayer equals power, but what power are you referring to? I mean, man, that that that's the kind of when you're a young Christian, you love that kind of stuff, man. Yeah, you know, you know, man, a prayerless Christian is a powerless Christian. I'm going to pray. I'm going to get power, and then you're going to like, man, I'm still struggling with sin. Where is the power? Where what power do I have? And you know what else is essential? I'll tell you what's essential, and I can see it right here in front of me. The church is essential. The church is essential. And there has been some differing opinion and debate on this point. 
not with the people of God, but with others. The church has been categorized and placed as essential as sporting events, as movie theaters, as concert venues. We're in what they say, phase three. Restaurants are labeled more essential. Tattoo parlors, more essential. Salons, more essential. Schools, more essential. And although I have no problem with any of those establishments, and I have friends in those industries who are praying, and we're praying with them for all of these places to open up again so they can get back to work. But I believe that the church is right to assemble is just as important and critical. For we not only have a constitutional right provided for us, but we have a heavenly command and mandate that's been given to us, and we must obey God's command. But in Hebrews chapter 10, it exhorts us, not forsaking the assembling of ourselves together in the manner of some, and exhorting one another in so much... It's amazing how popular that verse has become during the COVID uh, situation. Don't forsake the assembly. We have to meet. We have to meet. We have to meet. It's a constitutional right. We have to meet. And then, hey, we're going to cancel service on 4th of July for the uh, 4th of July picnic. And we're going to cancel services to celebrate the the birth of Christ. And we're going to cancel services to celebrate the Easter egg and the Easter bunny. And and we're going to sell And we're going to cancel services to celebrate this. And we're going to cancel. But, oh, don't forsake the assembly. Don't forsake the assembly. So one time it's don't forsake the assembly assembly and in the other times we can forsake the assembly when we want to see we like to forsake the assembly when we want to but if someone else tells us we have to then we get mad oh we're going to cancel sunday night services because we can't get enough people there we're going to cancel wednesday night services because we can't get enough people there okay that's 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 what drives me crazy sometimes about christians we just pull scripture and again this goes back to what we talked about we spent a long time talking about it the regulative principle and the normative principle is the regulative principle is you can never forsake. Well, if you can never forsake, then what do you do when uh, 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 church members don't show up? And they're not sick. They're forsaking the assembly. Is that even, is that a church discipline issue? Do, 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 do they need to be confronted? Like, what do you do? But we, we preach it. Well, yeah, we're going to pre- we're preaching it hard now because we're going to we're preaching it towards the government. Hey, the government can't tell me to not assemble. But then the next, as soon as we're all back together, watch how quickly church services get canceled. I mean, how many churches cancel services for the Super Bowl? Well, what? Don't forsake the assembly of ourselves. Yeah, but it's not. We're not forsaking it because we all came together. We all agreed together to to not have the service. So, but the church is essential. I got no problem with the church is essential, okay? I got no problem with it being essential. That, that's not even an issue, right? But what, are you saying that church somehow does what for my Christian life? Like what, what, what makes, needs to take place? All right, we're about out of time. Let me try to finish this. More as you see the day approaching. Those that downplay or diminish the role of the church Say, well, you can simply meet online. You don't need to assemble. But how many of you have learned over the last nine weeks that there's only so much that is transferable through a screen? Oh, I can tell you by experience that speaking into people's lives personally is far more effective than speaking into a camera remotely. That there is definitely something missing. And you know what it is? It's you. It's the people of God. We're a body of believers. We're the family of God. We're the church of Jesus Christ. And although we respect and understand social distancing, we also understand the importance of social interaction and the danger of continual isolation. And so here we are (laughs) this morning. Jesus is essential. God's word is essential. Prayer is essential. The church is essential. And hope is essential. The word hope, from a biblical perspective, means without doubt and uncertainty. The biblical word for hope is a confident expectation and assurance based on a sure foundation for which we wait with joy and full confidence. There's no doubt about it. Guys, listen, we have a living hope that's been given to us through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead. There are many, maybe even some of you in your cars right now, you're seated there, you're glad to be here, but maybe you are losing or even have lost hope. But I want to tell you something, friends. Listen, we are the people of hope. That's who we are. 
Church, don't forget that you have the hope of heaven. This world is not all that there is. This time here on earth, it's just a stop along the way. The Bible says right now we are citizens of heaven. Heaven is our hope. It's our hope. The Bible says, I know the plans that I have for you, declares the Lord, plans to prosper you and not to harm you, plans to give you a future and a hope. Hope is essential to... I, I give up. I, what can be said? What, see, selling it, 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 selling a fake creation and then telling you that these are the things you need to have this and, and hey, God has plans for you to, not to harm you, not to, but to bless you, do all these wonderful things and he's selling something that's not even a, that, that oh. Day. I give and up. Not only is hope essential, and Jesus essential in God's word and prayer. But listen, faith is also essential. The Bible says without faith, it is impossible to please him. For anyone who comes to God must believe that he exists and that he is a rewarder of those who earnestly seek him. Faith is essential. Perhaps no other component in the Christian life is more important than faith. Faith is belief in the one true and living God. By faith, we understand that the worlds were framed by the word of God so that the things which are seen were not made of the things which are visible, the Bible says. Faith is essential because we walk by faith and not by sight. Faith is essential because through faith, we overcome the devil. By faith, we're saved by grace through faith. We stand in faith. We serve in faith. But right now, folks, I know that you know this, and and I know you're experiencing this because we are as well. Right now, our faith is being tested. Do you feel it? I know that you do. Our faith is being tested. And this testing of our faith, you know what's happening? It's developing our faith. The testing of our faith, can I say this to you? It is toughening up our faith. It's toughening us up, and we need it for the days ahead, friends. We don't know what's going to happen in the future. We know who holds the future, but listen, the way things are going, things that we're experiencing right now, listen, this is the time for the church to be refined in their faith so that when more obstacles come, that we're ready to stand. And there were many times in the ministry of Jesus where he looked at his disciples, and they struggled with their faith. We're not alone in this. And there were moments when Jesus asked his disciples this question right here, where is your faith? Where is it? And perhaps the Lord's asking that question to some of us today. Where's your faith? You know that I'm faithful. Don't doubt me. Where's your faith this morning? Is your faith and trust in the Lord? Is your faith in the economy? Listen, it will falter. Is your faith in the government? It's divided. Is your faith in doctors? They don't know everything. Put your faith in God. Trust in the Lord with all your heart. Don't lean on your own understanding. Acknowledge him in all your ways. He will direct your paths. Don't hold back. He is faithful. Trust God. Have faith in God. It's essential. Jesus is essential. God's word is essential. Prayer is essential. Church is essential. Hope is essential. Faith is essential. We're almost through. The Holy Spirit is essential. The Holy Spirit, friends, is not some mystical force, impersonal power, some floating phantom. The Bible declares that the Holy Spirit is God, that he convicts the world of sin, of righteousness, and of judgment to come. Jesus said, as right before he left, he told his disciples, I'm not going to leave you orphans. I'm going to leave you the Holy Spirit. He's going to be with you. He's going to be in you, and he's going to come upon you. He's going to empower you. The Bible tells us that the Holy Spirit is a divine person with mind, emotions, and will. He can be blasphemed. He can be grieved. He's a person. And the Holy Spirit is essential for several reasons. For one, he points us to Jesus. The Holy Spirit reminds us of all the things that Jesus said. The Holy Spirit is essential as he gives us freedom. The Bible says where the Spirit of the Lord is, there is freedom. The Bible tells us that our bodies are the temple of the Holy Spirit, where the Holy Spirit resides and dwells. The Holy Spirit is essential because he's the one who empowers the believer to live the Christian life. Jesus said it, you shall receive power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you and you shall be my witnesses in Jerusalem and in all Judea and Samaria and to the ends of the earth. And listen to this, folks. This is great news this morning. 
Listen, the Holy Spirit is essential because in Romans chapter 8, verse 11, it says, if the spirit of him who raised Jesus Christ from the dead dwells in you, then he who raised Jesus Christ from the dead will also give life to your mortal bodies through his spirit who dwells in you. Did you hear that? I hope you did. It says that the same spirit of God that raised up Jesus Christ from the dead is alive and well in every believer right now. Guys, that is power enough to make it through this season we're in. The Holy Spirit is essential. And maybe up to this point, you, you've known about the Holy Spirit, but you've never asked the Lord to empower you with the Holy Spirit. Why not right now? This is as great a time as any to say, Holy Spirit, fall afresh on me. They did in the book of Acts. They said, Lord, give us the boldness. Lord, empower us. And maybe today that's exactly what you need, a fresh outpouring of the Holy Spirit on your life. And God is not reluctant to pour it out. In fact, he says, ask me and I'll pour it out on you. Do that now. Do that now. Get some more power. Get some more power. I don't know why you have to ask for the power if the power is already inside of you. But I guess we got to ask for the out, outpouring of the power that's already in us. I, 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 yeah, okay, whatever. There you have it. Typical, That that's just how it works. So while we've been struggling with four keys, trying to figure them out, this is the way it's usually, here are the essentials. You get the essentials, you get this great Christian life where you have power, you overcome sin, you're victorious, you have this, you have that, you have this, and 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 it's sold that way, and then everyone's like, amen, and you hear all the people clapping, yay, and then, then you want to go find them on a Wednesday and go, hey, how are things going? Because you were sure clapping and so, so sure that it was all going to work out, and then there you go, but th- that's just a good example. I just wanted you to hear it because it fits with what we've been trying to do, and I mean that's that's a sermon that was uh, uploaded I think today or yesterday. So that's that's a that's a very common thing I, when I when I talk about how how vague these these this teaching is. I'm not making it up. That's that's what I've been talking about. When you look at these four keys or you look at five keys, it's always just these vague like hey hey do this do this do that. They don't even really tell you what to do. Just you need this you need this and boom it's all going to work out. And you're kind of like well. I, I still don't really understand how I'm supposed to live the Christian life and how it's supposed to work because I think we we have been sold um, that there's like a, you know, a six, well, not even really a 12-step a program because in the 12 steps, they get a little bit more specific. It's just vague principles that we say amen, thinking we're going to live some Christian life that really is a fantasy in many cases. Now, I know that makes a lot of people not happy with me to say that, but you know the reality. I know the reality. And I think we have to come up with a different way of thinking. And uh, I don't think when we're done looking at the four keys that are offered in, in, in the book that I'm using, I think I don't think we're going to be any better off. I mean, put off, put on. Like, okay, th- that's very specific, but you're going to realize you don't always do that. So then what, what's, how do I get Christian? I don't have Christian growth and Christian victory until I can put everything off and put everything on and then live that way consistently. That, it's That's not... That's we need a new way to describe the Christian life. So you can think about that. All right, I would challenge you to try to answer those questions about uh, was it Second Peter chapter one? Uh, work on that. Look up some commentaries. Probably be a good study, and uh, you'll probably get far more out of that than what we just got. All right, I'll stop right there. Everyone have a great night. God bless. <laughs>